All right. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, I do. Uh, I do feel like uh, my message this morning has changed multiple times, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly where we're going to go, but you know, one of the things that I did want to or do want to talk about this morning is is the transformation of the Holy Spirit and um, and just the new life. And I feel like right from the, the beginning of this moment, you know, I, I'm kind of noticing this trend that we're, we're starting to have church before the service. And so if you're missing prayer in the mornings, I would just highly encourage you to come out to uh, prayer on Sunday mornings. You know, we're gathering. Sometimes there's a little bit of worship we're praying, we're hearing some of the word, we're hearing these testimonies. It's a, it's a little more intimate, it's not so formal. I believe that that's what God wants uh, church to be. I believe that, that God wants us to devote ourselves to prayer and to the fellowship and, and to the word um, and those sort of things, but not always in a formal setting. You know, sometimes in a more intimate and more personal setting. Uh, from the beginning this morning, uh, just kind of been in tears, so I'm not sure if that's going to go away or not, and so thanks, Maggie, for twice putting me in tears. But, you know, just even as, like, uh, as we were worshiping, and I just, uh, I took, I don't know why this thing's cutting out, but I, I took a couple screenshots of some of the lyrics that also were just, uh, I don't know, they, it's just this, the presence of the Holy Spirit was, was here this morning, and, uh, one of the lyrics of the songs that we sang, it says, You father the orphan, your kindness makes us whole. You're a shoulder, you shoulder our weakness, your strength becomes our own. You're making me like you, clothing me in white, bringing beauty from ashes, for you will have your bride free of all her guilt and rid of all her shame and known by her true name. And so, yeah, ha! Yeah, hopefully. It's, it's a powerful thing, you know, it's a powerful thing, and, and it's a part of what I want to talk about. And, uh, you know, just another verse that we sang is it says, if you've been forgiven, and if you've been redeemed, sing the song forever to the Lamb. If you walk in freedom, and if you bear his name, sing a song forever to the Lamb. And uh, it's just a powerful thing to, to know that you have been set free. It's actually the transformation of the Holy Spirit that does this. And it's nothing that we can do on our own. It's nothing that we can work for or that, that we can attain it's something that we can believe, and it's something that we can trust. It's something that we can read, but unless it's made alive by the Holy Spirit, then it's just something, yeah, it's just a belief, right? It's not a truth. It's not a truth that transforms our heart. And so, you know, this morning as I was, you know, this week as I was, as I was thinking about where we're going to be going this, uh, in the next little bit, we've kind of hit this transition in Colossians, or we're going to hit this transition in Colossians, where we've gone from this place of who Christ is to what our life looks like in Him. Um, so, so, you know, the message that I kind of want to start to bring, and, and it's going to take us maybe a few weeks, it's going to, we're going to be here for a little bit of time, because I can't share with you on one Sunday morning, um, all the things that this means and how it can transform your life and how it can change your life. But, um, you know, this morning, the message that I, that, that I want to bring is called the trespass and the new life. Okay, and so I think it plays like a lot into what we've been hearing this morning, um, what we've seen so far this morning, just in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Um, what really I want to spend time in over the next few weeks is the new life, okay? Our church is named that for a reason. 
We didn't just come up with it because we thought that it was a fancy name. It's because it's like a biblical term of a transformed life that happens through the blood of the Lamb and through the Word and through the transformation of the Holy Spirit. And it's a new life that we can live, okay? So I want to be teaching this over, over a few weeks. Um, but I want to encourage everybody to start looking at what the Bible says yourself about the new life, about being born again. What is this regeneration? What is this transformation? What is this rebirth? What does it mean? These are weird words. But you know what? I was just thinking this morning, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation. It's the power of God unto a transformed life. When we're talking about the blood of Jesus and the lamb and all of these things, and as, and as wildly crazy as it might seem, it's where we find life. We heard Maggie's testimony of a transformation. And that's the thing, is that God can come into our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit in a second and transform our lives. You know, I was just thinking this morning that I, I don't really know where the church is today. You know, I used to think I knew, and, and at least we used to believe and stand on biblical truths. But over the last 30 years, you know, 26 years for me being a Christian, but I was like raised in a Christian home before that. So even over 30 years, I think it's pretty safe to say that we've been pretty heavily influenced by our culture, by politics, different agendas that have influenced everyone through the power of social media or even our education systems or whatever it is. And, and if you work in our education systems, I, I just want to say thank you. you. You are a light there. You're bringing hope there. Well done, okay? Because that's where, you know, you need to be. So I just wanted to say that. But, you know, our society has taken God out of everything it believes. Um, and it certainly shows, doesn't it? But I also believe that the church's greatest deficit is biblical illiteracy. And so what do I mean by that is that believers don't read their Bibles and allow the Holy Spirit to transform their hearts and minds with the Word of God. And I'm not saying that this is you or this is new life. I'm just saying that this is what I believe that is the greatest deficit of the church right now is that we know about God but we don't allow the Holy Spirit to transform our lives and, and, and bring us into following Jesus to becoming the bride that he is coming back for. We know about him, but if we're not in his word and if we don't let the Holy Spirit speak to us through that word, we don't actually know him. And I just want to say that it's impossible to know God without the truth and the Spirit actively in our lives. I know, I know these days that a lot of us, you know, we're okay with being di discipled by TikTok. We have what seems to be an infinite amount of knowledge at our fingertips with, with AI now. But we as the church need to learn to follow the Holy Spirit in becoming the Bride of Christ. If you, this is just the introduction, but if you've based your faith on what I or what anyone else has told you on a Sunday morning or on social media, you're in big trouble. I mean, I come every weekend trying to do my best, but I'm not the Father, I'm not the Son, and I'm not the Holy Spirit. That's the relationship. Hallelujah. Yeah, absolutely. Good thing, right? Danielle? Awesome. Thank you for the feedback. <laughs> Hallelujah. But yeah, so like I said, I want to start talking about the new life. Um, but before that, I just want to lay down this like foundation of what the Bible calls the trespass. 
okay? And we do find that in Colossians 2, and I'm going to rewind a little bit again to Colossians 2.13. Um, the reason I'm doing that is because every single week when I'm reading the Word, when I'm reading through Colossians, I'm looking for something that I believe that the Holy Spirit is highlighting to me so that I can bring that thing, and it's not just my own thoughts, and it's not just my own, uh, you know, personal agenda. Um, I, I always try to never... Um, become personal with anything that I'm speaking on a Sunday morning. So I'm not thinking about any of you when I bring this message. I'm trying to find what God is saying to me. And if it's convicting you, that's between you and him, okay? Because I'm not trying to do it myself. But in, but in Colossians 2.13, we see this, and it reads like this. It says, You were dead because of your sins, and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. And in this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. And to just... To be laying this foundation, it says that we were dead because of our sins and because of our sinful natures. And this, this, this thing of being dead is like, of course, we're, we're all alive. We all have life. We're sitting here right now. We have breath, uh, we have breath in our lungs. But metaphorically speaking, that this means that we're no longer connected to the source of life. And it's because of this state that the Bible describes the sinful nature and and just this, this sinful nature, if you've never heard that before, it's, just, it's simply a deviation from the truth. It's, it's described as a fall, a slip up. You know, a friend of mine was just telling me that he was out and he was, and he was hunting uh, mountain goats and he was, and he was on these, these rock, shale, shale lock, rock faces and he, and he slipped and, and, he, and he fell and he dislocated his shoulder. And, and, and how many of us know that this is a really bad place to be doing that when you're in the middle of the wilderness that you, that you slip and you fall and you dislocate your shoulder? And he said... He was able to pop it back in and then a little while later he slipped again and he dislocated his shoulder again and I was just like, dude, that sounds like a rough trip, right? <laughs> but the Bible says that there was, there was this deviation, there was this slip up. It's also known as a fault and, and, in, and, and if we think of a fault, it's like think of like tennis, right? In tennis, what do they say when you have a fault? You, you serve outside of the lines. You're not in the court any longer. You're not within the boundaries that are set for the game, right? And it's a fault. It's outside of the boundaries that were set. You know, really to sum up in three words the trespass, and, and, and I think we'll look at this a little bit more in weeks to come too, is that there's, there's three words that I can use to describe it. It's, Pride, disbelief, and rebellion. And so one of the things that I kind of see from our culture and from where we get our information from is that there's a lot of pride in the information that we get. It brings disbelief so that we are questioning, did God really say? And when we question what God says, it breeds rebellion. Because we don't actually believe that he is who he is, and he says what he says, and he's right to have those standards, right? So, so God has these standards that he set like the lines in a court, and, and man faulted and went outside of those lines, okay? We, a lot of us probably, you know what I'm talking about, but I want to I want to lay this foundation for the new life, right? That's what we're doing. And um, in the ESV, it says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us of all of our trespasses. And so, you know, this is trespass means that we've breached God's standards. Um, and this, that this trespass must be dealt with if a person is to be made alive and spiritually reconnected to God, who is the source of life. And trespassing creates hostility. So that's a point that I want to make, is that trespassing creates hostility. And I will, and I will give you an example of that. One time, 
I placed a tree stand, because I like hunting, on the border of what could or could have not been my property. I'm not sure if the fences were quite right, but that was the only tree at the end of my property, and it might have been a little on the wrong side. Maybe. But I can tell you the person who owned the property came to my house, and it wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a nice conversation, okay? It was a hostile conversation. He did not appreciate the fact that I was trespassing on his property, and rightfully so, okay? When, when, when we hunt, uh, we do hunt on, on private land quite often, and um, this year there's, there's signs on the property that we hunt, and it says, no hunting without written permission, okay? So if we are caught on that property without written permission, then the landowner has the ability, has the right to involve the authorities. And when the authorities are involved and the homeowner says they want to press charges, they have the authority of the government to press charges against you for trespassing. And then there's like, there's something that needs to be paid, okay? Like, this is just the way it is. And we understand these things, right? We understand tennis. We understand trespassing. We understand them in the natural sense. But when it comes to God, we go, but does he really say that? Right? But the point that I'm trying to make is that this trespass of the sinful nature created hostility between us and between God. But it says that, you know, one of the things that, like, like Kyle told me, like Kyle, I shouldn't maybe use his name, but Kyle's a, you know, Kyle's a CEO in town. He's the guy that gets to, uh, you know, serve the penalty <laughs> if we get caught on private land, right? But if the homeowner then says, I don't want to press charges, then there's a legal right for him to do that. He can let us off the hook. Right? And this is, this is what it's talking about when it says, he canceled the record of charges against us and he took it away by nailing it to the cross. And so, in Romans 8, 5, we see this. It says, those who are dominated, this is an important word, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws and it never will. And that's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. Okay, so I'm just laying this foundation. A lot of us may understand this, but it's good to have a solid understanding of this. So when we go to Colossians 2.13, and I'm going to read this part out of the Amplified just to kind of bring another angle It says, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, brackets, worldliness, manner of life, God made you alive together with Christ, having freely forgiven us of all of our sins, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of legal demands which were in force against us and which were hostile to us. And this certificate he has set aside and completely removed by nailing it to the cross. And so what I want us to see here is that there's a spiritual world, and there's spiritual laws that govern it. There was a trespass that created hostility, that brought charges against us, 
and by legal demands required a payment for the penalty and for the pay- and, and for the penalty but the payment was paid okay so that's where we get to live when we put our faith in Jesus Christ and so if we hop back now we're going to hop back into um, uh, Colossians 2:14 in the NLT Okay, that was in the Amplified. I'm going to carry on in the NLT. And it says, He canceled the records of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, He disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by His victory over them on the cross. So don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or for celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. For these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come. And Christ himself is that reality. Don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or the worship of angels, saying they have had visions about these things. Their sinful minds have made them proud. And they are not connected to Christ, the head of the body, for he holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments. And it grows as God nourishes it. Now here is, is, is where I want to kind of get at it. It says, you have died with Christ and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following the rules of the world such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch? Okay, so Christ has set us free from the consequences of the hostility that was created towards God from the trespass. You know, this deviation from the, from the truth. Whether unintentional error or willingful transgressions, it doesn't really matter. It's there, and it needs to be dealt with. And it can only be dealt with by the blood of Christ. And so what this is saying is, is that, so why do we think that we can fix this spiritual problem with physical solutions. The trespass was a matter of the heart, and it's an internal condition that can't be fixed with external laws, such as don't do this and don't do that. You know, we see that, we see this in, in, the, in the Old Testament that we say, but, but God had the law and they had to follow the law. And that's true. But what the law did was it showed them that they were incapable of following the law. It showed us that our hearts are what is the problem. It's not these external things that we do on the outside that it's the problem. But it's actually our heart that is the problem. In Matthew 15.10 Jesus called the crowd to come and hear. Listen, he said, and try to understand. It's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. You are defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. Right? And so what he's saying is is that that it's coming from within. That's what makes it hostile. That's what makes it... um, like hostile towards him. It's this nature that comes from within and it comes out of us. It's not something that we put in. It's something that comes out. And Paul is showing the believers that it's not about keeping the rules externally, keeping the sacrifices and the ceremonies, the pious self-denial, keeping the rules uh, that just become religious, that actually make us judgmental and proud. So if you've ever thought the church is judgmental and proud, it's probably because we're trying to keep external rules. And it's become religious. It's not a relationship with Christ any longer. It's not um, a part of allowing him to transform us and to renew us. It's just become something that we do. And then we are trying to make other people do it even if we aren't doing it ourselves. Okay, I believe... That's kind of the, the place that I grew up in, okay? But it's, but it's actually about something new. And it's about this new life that God gives us. And in uh, Colossians 2.20, it says, You have died with Christ, 
and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following the rules of this world? And so this is not a covenant of external things like the old covenant. You can't be right by God by following all of these rules. It's an internal covenant of transformation, a rebirth, a rebirth, and a new way. And so we see these things in places like Ezekiel eleven nineteen, where the, it, they, these prophetic messages that were showing what was going to be the future covenant. And um, Ezekiel eleven nineteen says something like this: It says, "I will give them singleness of heart and put a new spirit within them. I will take away their stony, stubborn heart and give them a tender, responsive heart." In Jeremiah 31, 33, it says, But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And then we see in the New Testament, Paul in 2 Corinthians 3, 3 says, Clearly, you are a letter from Christ showing the results of our ministry among you. This letter is written not with pen and ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. It is carved not on tablets of stone, which is external, but on human hearts. And so, if you've died with Christ and he has set you free, and our life is now in him, why do we still live as though nothing has changed? That's, that's kind of what Paul is saying, right? Why are we living as nothing has changed if this is like the reality that we now have the ability to live in? And so, other words is, why are we still being dominated by the sinful nature and not letting the Holy Spirit be in control? And so, this this is the part of the thing is that the sinful nature dominates us. And it says in the word that we actually, without Christ, can't get from out from under that domination. But, it's, but when we have faith in Jesus and we believe in Jesus and when we trust in Jesus and we're filled with the Holy Spirit and we allow him to have control of our lives, that's when the transformation changes. And so this is a difficult thing to do, isn't it? Because we don't want to give up control. But when we don't give up control, you see... We're in control either way. We can either keep control and be dominated by it, or we can allow it, or we can give it up, and we can be free from it. And so, you know, what Paul is saying is that why do we think that the old way of thinking, that our old way of thinking before we accepted Christ, is going to help us succeed at all in this new life? You know, it's like there's no human programs, no church programs, no amount of religious practices or spiritual strictness, no matter how severe you treat your own body, no amount of self-will or self-help is going to heal your sinful nature. Colossians 2.22 says such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate when we use them. These rules may seem wise, but they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline. But they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. And so this is, this is where I want to just hang my hat for a few more minutes this morning, is that the Bible tells us that all of these human precepts and teachings, traditions, and disciplines, they all have the appearance of wisdom but they provide no help in conquering a person's desires. We can only be set free and healed from our sinful nature by faith in Christ and our identity in him. You know, and what is our identity in him? Well, verse 20 says, I have died with Christ and he has set me free. And so there's this, there's this identity when, when, we, when we have faith that Christ has done it for us, That we die to ourselves and our identity becomes his identity. 
And so this is how God sees us. This is the legal right that we have to become right in his eyes, to have right standing with him, to go into the courtroom, to experience the presence of God. It's because of what Christ has done, and it's because of our faith in him that allows us to do that. And that's it, right? We have died with Christ. To die with Christ in faith is the only thing that can make us free. And so, you know, this chunk of scripture was speaking to, you know, certain cultural mindsets of, uh, 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 of, of, the, the, uh, of the Jewish people at the time that were bringing different things into the church, of the of Greek mysticism, all of these things that we've talked about. We've talked about how we have our own things that we bring into our life. Um, but, um, you know, basically... What we need to see here is that don't be led to believe that your salvation can be obtained or maintained by anything other than faith in Christ. Okay? So this is so that so so we have the we have the trespass, we have the redemption, we have the faith, okay? Right? And 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 that's what we have to build on and that we have to trust and that we have to have our identity in is that he has done it for us, right? But then there's this complicated part on, on it talking about how, we were, how we're supposed to live. And this is where it gets tricky, I think, for a lot of us, is because once again, the Bible sets the standard sets God's standard, which we see as we enter into um, Colossians 3, but then there's also this reality of, you know what, we're just kind of messed up people, aren't we? And living that standard isn't, oh, isn't always as easy as just somebody on the stage on a Sunday morning telling you that you need to live a certain way, is it? We all make bad mistakes. We all fail. We all, we all mess up. We find ourselves in places that we don't want to be. We, we can become addicted to things. And, but what about God's holy people? That's the tough reality of this whole thing is that we're washed and waiting. I don't know if you hear, like we're washed and waiting. We're, uh, it's, it's the now, it's the, it's the now but not yet part of this thing. And so what are we supposed to do in this place of being made right with God and then living in a certain way that reflects who he is? Even though we, are, we, we, we mess up and we make mistakes and we do all of these things, but, you know, the whole thing is that we can't We can't correct that behavior by external things, right? That's what, that's what I'm trying to say. That, that, that we need to address the, the problem, and the problem is within our heart. And only Christ can transform us through the power of the Holy Spirit and can address the root sin that is the internal problem. And so then as we go into like Colossians 3, it says this, it says, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ. That's why we're called new life. It is part of the new life. Since you have been raised with new life in Christ. So you see that there's this dying process that we, we die to ourselves. We make him Lord. We, we, uh, we, we pursue to follow him to the best we can, relying on uh, the Holy Spirit. And, and, and we're raised to this new life. So we have this new life that is given to us. This ability, this new heart, this new birth, this, this regeneration. It's been given to us by the Holy Spirit. That's how God sees us. But then we need to learn to walk this thing out. Right? And so it says... Since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand, the courtroom again. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. This is part of the process. It's like, you know what? 
We're not supposed to be thinking about all the things of this earth any longer. We're supposed to redirect our focus and our attention and our mindset to the things of heaven. It says, for we've died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all of his glory. And so like I said, this is, this is kind of complicated text. You know, it's Christ who set us free, but we still are asked to do something about that. It says, then in verse 5 here, it says, so put to death the sinful nature. Okay, so put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. But we can't do this with mere human rules that seem wise but provide no help in conquering a per- person's sinful desires. But we're supposed to conquer or put to death the sinful earthly things that lurk inside us. So, so what it's saying is that, okay, you're supposed to put to death these things that are lurking inside of you, but you're not going to be able to do it the way you think you should be able to do it. Okay? You have died with Christ and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. Why do you keep on following the rules of this world such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch? And it's like, and so once again, it's like, okay, I'm trying to lay this foundation is why can't we do this? I want us to really understand why we can't do it the way that we think that we want to do it, right? And I've said that it's an internal thing. It's a thing of the heart. Um, and so I just want to look at us uh, for a second here at, at um, at, at uh, where do a person's evil desires come from, right? And what does the Bible say about that? The Bible says they come from within the heart. And it says that these desires are not external, but are rooted deeply within us. And they reflect the sinful nature that resides in all of us. And they're seen by fruit that we produce, okay? So in Mark seven twenty one to 23, it says, Jesus says this, he says, For it is written, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, evil, uh, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. And these evils come from inside and defile a person. Right? This is, this is the hostility. The things that come from with inside our hearts, like these things that we mentioned, they defile us. And they cause hostility between us and God, which separates us from him. And it removes us from the life that God has for us. Okay? And so, then it tells us that they will be obvious. Right? In Galatians 5, 19 to 21, once again, is like, this is where we get it. It says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. It goes through the list again, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And I warn you, as I did, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God, right? Because like we've been talking about, it, just these things create hostility towards God, and they separate us from God. And so James 1, 14 to 15 says, it also explains the progression of the evil desires when left unchecked and how they separate us from God. But it says, each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. And so this is kind of this process that the Bible is trying to help us to under, uh, understand um, why we need this freedom, why we need to be, uh, why Jesus was the only one that was able to provide uh, the, the legal right for us to have a relationship with God because he took the punishment for the crime, right? And then, and then when we, so then when we go back into Colossians 3, 5, it says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to the earthly nature, like sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. And so, and so it's saying like, 
Now, because you have been given this freedom in Christ, it's your responsibility through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the word, through faith, through trusting in God, to put these things that cause hostility and separation to death. Because we don't want to live in this place of hostility with God. We don't want to live in a place of, 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 of separation from God. Um, and so if you're, if you're tracking with me, I, I, I am going somewhere. But so this is like so far we've seen that evil desires are from the sinful nature and are rooted in the heart and, they're corru- and they corrupt the mind. They lead to hostile behaviors towards God, which cause a separation from him and a spiritual death. Christians are therefore told to kill the earthly nature and its desires and to not be dominated by them anymore by by relying on the Holy Spirit and by giving control over to him so he can help us overcome these things. Okay, that's good. I heard some amens. But we're not, but we're told to recognize the things that are a part of the old self and to no longer let them define us, but to define our identity in a new life with Christ. And so, I've got, I've got a whole bunch more stuff here uh, to just go into the new life, what it looks like, what the what the new life looks like, you know. Um, it, uh, but I'm but I'm not going to share that this morning. It just it just opens a whole new like can of worms, so to speak. But you know, basically, you know, we can see how the Bible tells us to walk this thing out, right? And um, and we'll talk about this more in depth, but. The way that I would describe it and the way that I see it in the word is that, is that um, it's like a life of instead of, instead of. You know, we're going we're gonna to look at it over the next few weeks and we'll see in Ephesians 4, at the, at the end of Ephesians 4, you can read that this week. Um, but Yonku will be preaching next week, so I'm not exactly sure where he's going to go with this, but he is going to continue talking about the new life. But, but there's a bunch of instead of, instead of living like this, live like this. Instead of living like this, live like this. And so, and so this is the process that we, that we walk out as believers. It, and, and it, like a simple example of that would just be like, okay, um, Let's just, let's just think about greed, okay? So most of us would probably think that we're not greedy, but I think that if we define greedy, we would all, you know, consider ourselves greedy. But it, are we supposed to focus on greed and not being greedy? No, because it won't work. That's kind of what I'm trying to say, right? But the, whole, but the Bible says that instead of being greedy, be generous, and so we, because of this life instead and the, and the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, this one is about self. It's about me. I'm greedy. I'm doing these things. I'm keeping all my money for myself, all my possessions for myself. I'm, I'm storing up, even if it's just little things for me, it's, it's about self. But this one is about somebody else. And so how do we die to self? We live a life of instead of. So instead of it being about me anymore, I'm going to consciously, in the power of the Holy Spirit, be generous instead, which is therefore going to kill the flesh, and it's going to bring me into a life of the Spirit, where we live a different, different way. And so when we can compare this through, through, through all of the different things, but, but we can't do those two things at the same time. You know, we heard this study about anxiety and thankfulness, and actually scientifically it's proved, right, if you remember any of this, is that you can't have anxiety and be thankful at the same time. Like your brain just physically can't do that. And so this is like kind of the same principle. It's like you can't be greedy if you're being generous. And so that's and so that's what we're called to kind of walk out in this new life. But then once again, we always got to go back to this place is that we're secure. We're secure in what Christ has done for us. We are not doing these things 
for our own salvation or to produce our own salvation. We're doing it out of this place of, like I even said this morning, when we recognize the freedom that Christ has given us and that he has taken the dominating power of sin away so that we can make right choices, so that we can live like Christ and so that we can be an example and a reflection of who he is to this world. And we're not going to do it perfectly, okay? But it is our goal. It is, our, it is the desire of our heart to, to, send, to, to, to head that way, to follow Christ. And to put these things to death. Because we don't want them in our lives any longer. Because they, they're hostile. They're separators from God. The tree stands on the wrong side of the fence. You know, and so, and so, yeah, so I'll end with that today because like I said, this is just going to be a process now of starting to talk about the new life and I don't know, Nathan, I'll just kind of hand it over to you and you can go where you want with this, but uh, 